This building behind me is the Rio Grande Depot in downtown Salt Lake City. For over 100 years, this train station has been a city icon, a community gathering place, and a connection to the world. Or at least, it used to be. The last train stopped here in 1999, after which the tracks were pulled up and paved over. Why were the tracks torn up? It's because they were just like these ones here behind me. They ran down the middle of busy downtown streets, which is bad for all kinds of reasons. So, as the city prepared for the 2002 Winter Olympics, a decision was made to consolidate all railroad tracks to their own right-of-way on the west side of downtown. This meant, unfortunately, that the beautiful and iconic Rio Grande Depot would be replaced by a new intermodal hub a block and a half farther away from the downtown core. This decision made sense at the time, when Salt Lake City saw only two passenger trains per day, and both of them in the dead of night. However, today, Salt Lake City sees over 60 passenger trains and thousands of passengers every weekday, thanks to UTA's new frontrunner commuter rail system. In fact, the frontrunner is routinely ranked as one of the top 10 commuter rail systems in the United States. These numbers don't only justify a better transit hub, they demand it. To that end, my friend Cameron Blakely and I have put together a vision we call the Rio Grande Plan. By relocating the railroad tracks on the west side of downtown into a below-grade structure called a train box, we would be able to restore rail service to the historic Rio Grande Depot, eliminate four and a half dangerous downtown railroad crossings, and free up 50 acres of land for new urban development. Those 50 acres would then bring in enough new investment and revenue to pay for the original cost of the train box, making this plan entirely self-funding in the long run. To learn more about this plan, you can either go to our website at riograndplansaltlakecity.org and download our free booklet, or you can keep watching this video where I will outline the most important points in the time-honored YouTube tradition of a top 10 list. Number 10. The Train Box Because the tracks were removed so recently, the right-of-way is still open, ready for the tracks to go back. In fact, here under I-15, the tracks were never even removed. Instead of going back on the surface, the Rio Grande plan proposes the construction of a train box, which is just what it sounds like. A big concrete box dug out of the ground that is big enough to hold full-size trains. Here's a train box in Los Angeles called the Alameda Corridor, which holds three tracks and is over 10 miles long. Another famous train box is in Reno, Nevada, where a two-mile-long box allowed the city to close 10 busy downtown grade crossings. Now trains sail through downtown at full speed, while street life continues on as normal up above. In Salt Lake City, we propose a train box that is only one mile long, beginning at 900 South and ending at 100 South. Thanks to our famously wide streets, it is possible to accommodate all present and future needs within the existing right-of-way, meaning no buildings will need to be knocked down in order to make way. We propose a box with six tracks, two for Union Pacific Freight and Amtrak passenger trains, two for UTA front-runner commuter trains, and two for future transit use, such as a line from Tooele Valley to Park City. The bottom of the box will be about 33 feet below surface level, making it deep enough to go below important utilities, but yet shallow enough not to interfere with the water table. But the best thing about the train box is that it can be completely disguised to look like a normal street. With a concrete roof similar to what you see in parking garages, the street can be rebuilt exactly where it was, with plenty of space left over for a raised median, ventilation, vegetation, bike lanes, and bus stations. Once this construction is finished, 500 West can be transformed from a neglected industrial street to a beautiful urban corridor where people actually want to live and do business. Number 9. The Historic Rio Grande Depot Many major cities, even here in the USA, are centered around their historic train stations. From New York City's Penn Station to Los Angeles' Union Station, the train station gives its city a sense of purpose and place, builds pride among city residents, and creates a first impression for commuters and visitors alike. Salt Lake Central Station provides none of this. While UTA has shown renders and grand plans for nearly 20 years, the intermodal hub remains a vast expanse of empty concrete, lacking even the most basic of passenger amenities, including shelter, restrooms, or even drinking water. Now imagine arriving in Salt Lake City and being greeted with this. Built in 1910 by the famed Chicago architect Henry Schlax, the Rio Grande Depot was immediately regarded as one of the finest train stations in the West. Though it has been closed to the public since the 2020 earthquake, repairs are fully funded and will be underway soon, so that once again, 
the Rio Grande Depot will be ready to welcome visitors from around the world to Salt Lake City. With the train box in place, a collection of stairs, escalators, and elevators will connect the platforms below to a covered plaza above, whereas the current transit hub relies on crosswalks over active railroad tracks to connect passengers to their platforms, the new Rio Grande platforms will be completely grade-separated, increasing safety and reliability while creating a friendlier user experience. Covered platforms will also be protected from the weather, including snow and ice, making rail an attractive option year-round. With features like these, Salt Lake City will once again have a train station it can be proud of. Number 8. The Third South Connection Few streets hold as much untapped potential as Third South. In the space of just five and a half blocks, this street connects with Pioneer Park, Main Street, State Street, three hotels, two dozen restaurants, a performing arts center, and the Rio Grande Depot. What it does not connect to is the intermodal hub, which is a big problem for anyone who wants to get here using transit. The problem is the Rio Grande Depot itself, which cuts the street in two. In a twist of irony, the new intermodal hub is blocked from downtown by the old train station it replaced. Ever since the tracks moved west, planners have been trying to establish a route for pedestrians to get past the Rio Grande Depot. Currently, you'll need to walk from 3rd to either 2nd or 4th South, and then back to 3rd. A distance of two and a half blocks just to travel half of a block west. Obviously, very few people do this, and this is one of the many reasons that Salt Lake Central Station sees such little pedestrian activity, and why none of the blocks surrounding it have seen any development in recent years. There simply isn't a good way for pedestrians to access the city's main transportation hub. This very real, but thankfully rejected, proposal for a streetcar passing straight through the Rio Grande Depot shows just how desperate planners are to find a connection. But of course, none of this would be a problem if the main transit hub were returned to its original location, the Rio Grande Depot. As the saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Number 7. A better transit map for downtown. A quick look at the Utah Transit Authority's rail transit map will show many excellent routes radiating out from downtown. However, it is also clear that these are designed to bring people into the city from the suburbs rather than move people around within the urban core. Planners have discussed new tracks lines for years, such as on 4th West and 4th South, or even complicating everything further by adding a short, separate downtown streetcar system. So far, none of these plans have moved past the conceptual stage because nothing really fits. For example, look at this S-curve that weaves back and forth through the busiest parts of downtown just to include the intermodal hub, and consider how much extra time and congestion that would add to people's daily commute. <laughs> The Rio Grande plan provides a better solution. By bringing the central transit hub a block and a half further east, the transit map can be greatly simplified, making it easier for riders to get around downtown and creating better connections between east and west. Number 6. A more walkable downtown. But why use transit downtown if you don't have to? Switching between modes just adds extra time and uncertainty to any trip. I mean, what happens if you miss your connection? Wouldn't it be better if your train could take you so close to your final destination that you could just walk there? Moving our transit hub to the Rio Grande Depot would place it a block and a half closer to downtown, which is a bigger deal than it may seem. Planners consider a comfortable walking range to be one quarter mile, shown here in green, with a maximum average range of half a mile, shown in orange. Translated to Salt Lake City, home of the largest city blocks in the world, the average pedestrian will walk comfortably for only a block and a half, with a maximum range of three blocks before it gets too far to be practical. Here, let's go for a walk, and I'll show you what I mean. From the basketball arena, it's four blocks to the intermodal hub. However, to the Rio Grande, two and a half blocks. Dinner and a show at P.F. Chang's in the Wagner Performing Arts Center? Well, that's six blocks from the intermodal hub, but two and a half blocks from the Rio Grande. Or maybe you prefer Mexican. Chile Pepin and the Crane Building are four blocks from the intermodal hub but to the Rio Grande, only two and a half. Staying at the Hampton Inn on 300 West, same story. 
four blocks to the intermodal hub, but two and a half to the Rio Grande. Headed to the convention center? Well, that's five blocks from the intermodal hub, but to the Rio Grande depot, it's three and a half. A bit of a stretch, but I'm sure you can make it. And finally, there's Pioneer Park, home to the downtown farmer's market. To the intermodal hub, it's four blocks, but to the Rio Grande, half a block. I mean, look, it's right there. The point is that the current intermodal hub relies on buses, light rail, and cars to get people the rest of the way into downtown, whereas the Rio Grande Depot is close enough that many people will choose to just walk. This will not only help decongest our buses, trains, and streets, but will build a happier, healthier lifestyle for our community and its residents. Walkable cities really are the best kind of cities. Number five, freeway ramps and overpasses. There are four big bridges over the railroad tracks on the west side of downtown at 4th, 5th, and 6th South. These bridges break up the street grid, create a confusing maze of one-way streets and blocked access, and make the whole neighborhood uninviting to pedestrians and street life. These bridges used to extend all the way to 3rd West until the 1990s when they were cut back as part of the Pre-Olympics Freeway Rebuild Project. Once the Rio Grande project is complete, we'll have the chance to cut them back some more, this time to 6th or even 7th West, depending on the direction of the ramp. This bridge here at 4th South can be completely eliminated, creating a surface street all the way to the Jordan River and beyond. By doing so, Salt Lake City can rejuvenate four city blocks that have been hemmed in by bridge approaches, and they can open up over a mile of street frontage that has been blocked off for decades. Number 4. 50 Acres of New Land Once the railroad tracks are relocated into the train box, the space currently occupied by the disused rail yards between 900 South and 100 South can be sold and developed. This has been done to many unused train yards across the country, but the best example is in Denver, Colorado, where the Regional Transportation District revitalized their Union Station back in 2014. This was no small overhaul. Union Station was given a beautiful new train hall, a new light rail terminal, and an underground bus concourse with 22 gates. The project also freed up 20 acres of former rail yards and industrial space for new urban development, and now holds multiple high-rises for residential and commercial use. Because transit access is so good, people and businesses are willing to pay a premium to live and work on this former industrial wasteland. This phenomenon isn't unique to Denver either. Many major projects in Sacramento, Portland, Seattle, New York, and soon Los Angeles prove that thriving neighborhoods can be built out of the most unattractive places, so long as the proximity to downtown is good and the connectivity is done right. In Salt Lake City, there are over 50 acres of land locked up beneath these railroad tracks, which is equal in size to five new city blocks, and all of it less than one mile away from Main Street in the heart of downtown. The possible uses for this land are limitless, from new parks and green space, to housing for thousands of new residents, to office and retail space. Whatever is chosen, one thing is for sure. The new development is guaranteed to bring in new revenue to the city. Which leads to my next point, number three. It pays for itself. Returning to Denver, the RTD claims that the Union Station Revitalization Project cost $500 million, which is a considerable amount of money. However, this government investment spurred a private investment of $3.5 billion in the surrounding area, in the form of new housing, businesses, office space, and other infrastructure improvements. $3.5 billion from $500 million is a return rate of over 700%, and it only gets better. All the new residents, the businesses, the new office space, the new hotel rooms, and all the new visitors to downtown are estimated to generate $2 billion of economic impact every year, providing thousands of jobs and generating significant tax revenue for the local governments. A significant portion of the original $500 million price tag was paid for through low-interest federal loans, and these are not only getting fully repaid by this new economic growth, but are getting repaid much earlier than planned. And it isn't just Denver. Sacramento estimates that their rail yard redevelopment plans will provide a home to 200,000 new residents and 14,000 direct jobs, as well as generate over $1.5 billion in private investments. Los Angeles is laying plans for redeveloping two rail yards beside the Los Angeles River, which in turn would spur an estimated $5.7 billion in private investment. And, of course, there is the Hudson Yards project in New York City, where a $20 billion complex of skyscrapers, built over top 28 acres of rail yards, is estimated to spur $19 billion of economic activity every year, generating over $500 million in new annual tax revenue for the city, 
and the list just goes on and on. The point is that all these rail yard redevelopment plans have extraordinarily high return rates compared to other investments in infrastructure. For example, the under-construction West Davis Corridor Freeway will cost Utah taxpayers over $800 million when that project is finished, with the national average return rate on investment for new highways being about $2 million per lane mile annually, the four-lane, 16-mile West Davis Corridor will return about $128 million to the Utah economy every year, meaning it will just barely break even after operating for six years. To match the 700% return rate equal to the Denver Union Station example, the road will need to operate for 44 years, and that number ignores regular costs such as maintenance, repairs, rebuilds, and other upgrades that will drag out the timeline even further. Redeveloping the rail yards downtown will provide a much larger and more immediate return on our public investment. And of course, without a public investment, this land will continue to sit dormant, not producing any significant revenue or economic impact. Now that, in my opinion, would be the real waste of money. Number 2. The Rio Grande Plan Heals the East-West Divide The phrase, wrong side of the tracks, has unfortunately rung all too true in Salt Lake City ever since the first rails arrived in 1870. Residents on the west side of town are figuratively, and often literally, cut off from the opportunities and services originating in downtown and the east side. The railroad tracks that run north-south along 600 west have come to act as barriers, where freight trains often stop to switch, or commuter trains come flying through at unsafe speeds. Even when the tracks are not blocked, the infrastructure around them can be daunting and unpleasant, and the gap in development can act like a sort of economic firebreak where both people and investments are unable to cross simply because it is too far of a distance. If these tracks are allowed to remain in place, there is very little that our local governments can do. Salt Lake City has done more than most, and has constructed two new multi-use trails to better connect east and west, those being the Nine Line Trail along 900 South and the Folsom Trail along South Temple. These are fantastic additions to their communities, but they still suffer from excessive railroad crossings. For example, at 800 West, the Folsom Trail crosses four railroad tracks all at once. Then, less than two blocks later, it crosses two of those same railroad tracks, plus two others. That makes eight tracks crossed in just one-third of a mile. Would you let your child walk or ride their bike to school or the library if you knew they had to cross eight railroad tracks to get there? Which brings us to the number one most important thing about the Rio Grande plan. Number one, improved safety. In developing news, a woman critically injured after being hit by a front runner train this afternoon. This all happening in downtown Salt Lake City near 600 West and 800 South. New overnight, a man is hit and killed by a front runner train in Salt Lake City. It happened at 9 South and 6 West. News for you. Front runner service resuming right now after being shut down for hours this afternoon as police investigated a death on the tracks. Who was hit by a front runner train in Salt Lake City this afternoon has died. A crash involving a car and a front runner train this morning. The driver of the car has died. That one person is dead after being hit by a train. About a woman and child hit by a front runner train. Or someone has been hit by a train. Killed by a front runner train. And was struck and killed. Hit by a hit and killed. Killed it. Killed it. Killed. Statistics show that in Utah, there are about 60 crashes between trains and the public every year, causing about 30 critical injuries and about 7 deaths. That's every year. And these are entirely preventable. Worse still, as our population grows and as UTA runs more frequent and faster trains, this number will only increase. Unless we do something about it. The Rio Grande plan would allow for the permanent closure of four historically dangerous crossings at 900 South, 800 South, 200 South, and 800 West. Additionally, the two UTA commuter rail tracks at 600 West would also be removed, leaving only Union Pacific freight trains. Combined, these four and a half crossings total to more than 300 activation events per day. That is 300 times every day when the gates go down and block our public streets and potentially set the scene for another fatality. With the tracks safely underground, this number will be cut to zero. Ultimately, 
A city is a place made for people, not for cars, trucks, or trains. These things are meant to serve the people who come here to work, learn, play, and live. When something isn't working for the benefit of those people, it is time to fix it. Our city is growing and changing. If we want to see big city investment made by the private sector, we need to make big city improvements to our public infrastructure, particularly our rail and transit systems. The Rio Grande Depot was once the center of our rail transportation network, and for 90 years, our community grew up around it. It can become the center again, and can bring with it the economic investment and revitalization that this area of town has been lacking for decades. Right now, we have the opportunity to create a world-class transportation hub, restore a historic train station to its original purpose, enhance the walkability, connectivity, and safety of our community, and add over 50 acres to our growing downtown core. While initially expensive, in the long run, this plan has the potential to pay for itself, and more. This opportunity won't last forever, so please contact your elected representatives and let them know that you like and support the Rio Grande plan. Because of all the many parties involved, from the railroads, to the Department of Transportation, to the Utah Transit Authority, to Salt Lake City, this plan will require real leadership and resolve to make a reality. This will not happen unless you show our leaders your support. This is our city. Together, we can make anything happen. I'm Christian Lenhart. Thank you for watching.